of justice. Uh, so while that we are trying to 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 to, to, uh, to, to attain or to reach uh, the ideal situation and to put our corruption cases uh, to court, but uh, I think also uh, uh, that that we should look into other alternatives. One other uh, one other uh, aspect is that uh, there should be an all-government approach in the sense that there should be an overall government policy as to what is the end state on the policy of corruption uh, eradication uh, is meant uh, to arrive at. Uh, if there is no such policy, then it would only be it would only be uh, a scattered uh, uh, handling uh, uh, of cases, and that would uh, reach nowhere. Uh, we have not yet found the absolute answer to all these questions. We are still in progress uh, to find the best uh, balance uh, between justice, uh, finding the truth, and uh, also a finding agreement as to how to close the book of the past and how to agree to look into the past because uh, it does not consist of only 5, 10, 20, 25 things that they do, we do, because I belong to the past also, uh, were, 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 uh, were common if we look it into the context of the past. But if we look at it from the values and context of the day, democracy, accountability, justice, then we see a picture full of corruption. Uh, so how do we pursue uh, all of this? Uh, I do not have the final answer, but those are all the aspects that, that have to be taken into uh, consideration. And uh, an overall uh, corruption eradication policy by the government is also not easy because uh, there seems to be the, the tendency that to make hard decisions in policies uh, in a democratic uh, setting is more difficult because of the deliberations or because of, uh, of, of, of uh, including uh, a wider uh, range uh, and uh, uh, aspect of uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, it would be more difficult, and as I have said, uh, it can even be seen as stagnant. Uh, so those are uh, the situations, the difficulties that that we encounter in the democratic transition. Again, uh, I do not have the answer. We are still in the progress of finding such answers. Thank you very much, and I hope we shall be more successful in this piece. Uh, one uh, point that was raised by uh, Mr. Jan Mujojo is the uh, security sector reform. And this is uh, very important in all the countries which made this transition. It was very uh, crucial that they reform security services. We have this problem here um, officially. The state security administration has been abolished and has been replaced by the um, national service uh, administration. Right. Uh, but still we need to reform the police force. It's not enough to remove the state administration. Uh, state security administration is important also to deal with the way you know, uh, police officers and policemen you know, treat uh, citizens. Uh, but we have not approached this uh, question yet. But it is very important in all the countries which make the transition to more democratic regimes. And one aspect of this security sector reform in Indonesia is to appoint the civilian Person to be the Minister of Defense. And this issue is never talked about in Egypt. And I must say that I know one Minister of Defense in Indonesia who was my colleague. We shared the room together. And he was a professor of political science at the National University of Indonesia, and Professor Yuono Sodasono, who uh, was the Minister of Defense uh, several times. So this is, I think, one major success of uh, the transition in uh, Indonesia. The other question, and I can really expect a brief answer, not exceeding two minutes. One is about religion and politics. 
this was an important issue in the two countries because of the uh, importance of the Catholic Church in the transition in uh, Poland and also because the major political force in Indonesia is uh, an uh, organization very similar to the Muslim Brothers. So uh, I start with uh, Professor Janusz uh, Onish. Okay, well, in, you know, in Poland we were in a rather comfortable situation because the church, especially under the, 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 the John Paul II, was very much for human rights. Uh, and this is why we had very often uh, even kind of a protection from, from, from the church. And as far as the influence of the Pope for the development of the situation in Poland is concerned, I would say that you know uh, his visit to Poland was. Uh, I would say that without this visit, nothing would have happened. No, no, but it helped. In what way it helped? Well, in Poland, you see, under the communism, we developed a certain way of of, of, of speaking. When we, when we said uh, them, we always knew what actually uh, what was, uh, what we had in mind. That means the Soviet Communist Party, the, the, the ruling group. Uh, but it was highly unclear uh, what we meant when we said us. Us was basically myself, my family, group of my friends, and that is about it. When the Pope came uh, and we suddenly saw millions of people attending uh, in, in these meetings, we realized that us is more as everybody. And since then, I could really answer uh, and discuss with, with, uh, with, with journalists from the West uh, who would sometimes try to call me dissident. I said, I'm not a dissident, they are dissidents in my country. Uh, so it was a kind of different situation. And on top of that, the papal visit to Poland was also on the state level organized by the authorities, but basically all these massive movements and gatherings were organized by people. Now, it was the first lesson in self-organization on a very massive scale. And the church played a, a role not only as kind of a kind of a protection shield, but also very often helped in very direct manner. I think that I can now tell because that that openly because it was already you know, published in the press that when we felt that Marshall was approaching, we decided to withdraw from banks quite a lot of money and hide it. But where to hide it? So our leaders went to, to Archbishop in Rostock and said, Your Excellency, could you actually keep this money for us? And he took it. <laughs> so um, that was a whole obviously we had no clues when they realized that we actually took the money away. But they didn't know really, really where this money was. So um, you know church not only gave us some protection and not only was supporting us, giving us a certain moral political support which really was extremely important. But on top of that, church played a role of I would say uh, also, it's a kind of a go between us and the authorities. Uh, what, what, I, what, what I, together with, with Western politicians, the authorities simply thought, you know, because they were sort of captives of their own, of their own mentality and philosophy, that solidarity was a genuine workers' movement. Why this movement was against the, 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 the workers' government, and workers' party, that was a, some, something mysterious, and the only way they can really solve this, this riddle was to say, well, it is a genuine workers' movement, but this movement is hijacked by extremists. So once these extremists are removed, everything will be fine. We were removed, we were in prison, but nothing so really know it was solved by, by that. And at that time, you know, we that we had no direct contact with the authorities, but we had contacts with the church, who simply could try to somehow persuade the authorities that we are not a band of rebels who is going to uh, going to grow up not only Poland but the whole Europe, just sort of creating uh, a global crisis, uh, rejecting communism and probably overthrowing or uh, um, sort of contributing to overthrow of Gorbachev. In, in Russia, but there are reasonable people. 
And on, and on top of that, when we started the round table negotiations, we were extremely worried that there would be all sorts of all sorts of accusations that there was a secret deal, that there was something under the counter. That's why we were very happy that two bishops at, at, attended all talks and they could say, well, no, it's nothing hidden, nothing, there's no hidden agenda, everything is overboard. And that was, I think, extremely, extremely important. It, that, that does not mean that now we have no problems with the with the church, it was just sometimes we would like to impose uh, certain, certain solutions in our civil code and, in, and other codes, uh, but this is another matter, and I think that we can give that some kind of something out. Uh, as far as other questions are concerned, well, you, you, you asked about economic assistance. Well, at that time we did not have any assistance from the European Union, but it, uh, that does not mean that we did not have any assistance. I think we, we had the assistance in two areas. One area was that we got a considerable loan uh, to secure this sort of economic transition process. And first of all, to secure uh, the, the rate of exchange of our currency. Uh, we, we never used this. But you know, it was extremely important also for those who would try to speculate on Paris law. The, 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 this knowledge that this law is there, so it cannot be sort of easily challenged and easily sort of played, uh, you know, as a way of the real exchange. And the second, which probably was more important, was that we actually managed to get an agreement on the restructuring of our debts. Uh, and this agreement was quite critical. The, the final outcome of our negotiations was that we simply, it was agreed that we would repay in installments, but this repayment was postponed for quite some time, uh, using also Brady, you know, the ideas and so on. Uh, but we would repay not the whole lot, we would repay something like 50 so that's that's the, the, the economic the economic system. Now the, the, the choice of the of the political system. Well, you know, in, in Poland we, we somehow uh, it was it was more or less generally assumed that we should have a parliamentary democracy. In Poland we never had a very strong sort of presidential system. Uh, you know, even when we, we had kings, kings in Poland were lifetime elected presidents. The kings were elected, we had very strong parliaments, king could, could not really sort of decide on, on, on law, on budget, on anything. So, you know, this uh, sort of weak, uh, weak central government was kind of a tradition. So, sort of very strong president uh, who was rather not to be accepted. But at the same time, clearly we had a, a problem, you know, how to, uh, what should be the electoral system. And we decided to go for proportional representation. Because what we were afraid of uh, was this, that if there would be you know, a system like British system, then one party which would have, say, some majority could totally dominate the political scene. Because this party can win all seats in the parliament uh, in a situation when Obama, but it's been presumed that this party has 30% of, 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 of support. And this is more a and all other parties have less than 30%. So this party can simply be all seats. So the only, the only solution was to, to decide for, for, for proportional representation. But again, we went through certain stages because at the beginning we had a proportional representation without threshold. It means every party you know, could get a certain amount of seats even if this party scored not, not that well. The result was that in the parliament we had about 25 different political groups, and it was a nightmare to form a stable coalition. Uh, so some kind of a threshold it was seen, uh, it, it was considered to be, to be necessary. I think that this threshold is, is a bit too high, it's about five percent. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, that's something which I would, which I would rather recommend. Uh, as far as the position of the president is concerned. President in Polish system has a certain role, it's not just a, a sort of a figurehead like, like in uh, Sweden or to some extent like in Germany, it's just a symbol of the state. Uh, he is an element of the system of checks and balances. President, for example, can veto legislation. President cannot veto the budget, 
that can veto all other legislation, which and his his veto could be sort of you know overruled by not by my by great majority. <coughs> so the president has a certain role, but again to stabilize the the political system, we opted for so-called constructive vote of non-confidence. What that I, I think that you are probably familiar with this concept, but I just will repeat for those from the few probably don't know. Uh, what it means, it means that you simply cannot simply uh, sort of, uh, you know, vote out of the office the government. At the same voting, you must appoint a union. Uh, and so that sort of, uh, that, that creates a situation in which you cannot have sort of, you know, all opposition parties disappointed with the government, ganging against this, this government and voting this government out of the office, and then there will be a political vacuum. There is no political vacuum. We must have already another, another prime minister. So this is more as the, 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 the situation. Or, religion and politics in three minutes. Religion and politics. Religion and politics. Uh, yes. Uh, we have the debate between religion and politics uh, since the uh, uh, inception of the Republic in 1945. There was a big debate, there were two groups. One group was called the Islamic group, and uh, they were uh, uh, opting uh, to, 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 uh, to put uh, Indonesia under the Sharia law. Uh, then there was President Shabana uh, and uh, President uh, or Vice President Hatta, uh, who were then called as the secular group and who opted for Pancasila uh, 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 out of those uh, debates uh, came a compromise that uh, Indonesia uh, will not be uh, a, uh, what do you call, uh, a state uh, under uh, the, the uh, Sharia law, uh, law. Uh, or neither uh, secular uh, in, in, in Asia. Uh, so they established the uh, Department uh, of, uh, of Religion. Uh, but uh, this seemed to be an unfinished uh, symphony. And uh, the uh, aspiration uh, for, for uh, those religious groups uh, still extends uh, until uh, the present time. So there are still groups uh, uh, carrying the aspiration uh, to put uh, Indonesia under the uh, Sharia, uh, Sharia law. Um, whereas uh, formerly uh, Pancasila uh, is the uh, basic philosophy of the state. Well, um, I open the floor now for discussion. You know, I would not like to monopolize the discussion, now, but there will be one question. If you want to ask it, I'll ask it. Uh, you know, what did the two countries uh, do uh, with regard to the former ruling party in Indonesia? Uh, President Suharto has a party of his own, and I think the party remains. Uh, it's one of the uh, active political parties. Uh, and in Poland, uh, the Communist Party remains, but I think changed its name. So, you know, how the two countries deal with the problem of the former uh, ruling party. But if you don't ask this question, I'll ask them here. The floor, the, the floor is open. The floor is open now. Uh, so, um, all right, please go ahead. Please uh, introduce yourself. Akkal Mahal. Akkal Mahal. Uh, my is Muhammad Mansour. أنا بطل بطل من الإخوة الجيوب إنهم يدور على على الاثنين يدور على السؤال ده المشاريع القومية اللي أتت بعد أو في بداية المرحلة تحاول الديمقراطي في بلديكما ما هي طبيعة هذه المشاريع ممكن تكون مشاريع اقتصادية ممكن تكون مشاريع تنموية وثقافية أي وات وات ما يعني عاوز نعرف هي طبيعتها وحجم النجاح بعد كل الفترة دي كلها حجم النجاح في حقيقة المشاريع إذا كانت المشاريع أصلا مدى مساهمة الدول الخارجية التعاون الدولي في إنجاح هذه المشاريع والمساهمات فيها سواء مساهمات مادية أو مساهمات معنوية وطبعا عاوز أعرف تأثير الدور الإقليمي المنظمات الإقليمية اللي الدول الدول فيها 
ومدى تاثير المنظومه التقنيه دي في تحكم عمليه حول المخابرات I have to explain يعني كل كده بالعربي هو في شركات مشروعات قوي دي موجودة عندنا خلاص انما هي مش موجودة في بلدنا I would like to explain what is meant by the question we always ask the president or whoever is in part of that the big national ambitious project like um, I don't know we have the high dam of uh, Aswan as one project uh, we expect the president Mark to come up with a very ambitious you know national uh, Deborah, um, so, uh, I don't know whether you have anything like this in your countries, but you know something uh, that you know all the forces uh, would support and would uh, participate in uh, realizing it. Right. And um, I think we'll ask uh, all the questions at the end. No, at the end. Yeah. yeah. So you take notes. All right. Please go ahead. Yeah. My name is Samir Khalafawi. I'm an engineer, graduate also from the American University here. I would like to ask about the infrastructure. You know, the, the political regimes of those uh, people who were uh, ruling for all that time, the autocratic regime, I think they put an infrastructure of, uh, of journalism, of media, of whatever. And what, how did you deal? with this big infrastructure that has been built upon decades after decades. It's not easy to change it and, uh, you know, to deal with a whole, you know, uh, an era of brainwashing <laughs> the, the, those, those the people. And I think this is also a question I'm asking nowadays about our situation here, how to deal with such uh, a, a, an era of about 60 years of brainwashing the people in a certain way and, you know, like trying to manipulate the personality of the people. How to deal with it? Thank, well, you. thank you very much. Uh, uh, hello, my name is Mohamed. My question goes to Janet Adams. Um, in Indonesia, um, I was wondering what was the weight or what role had the religious, the Islamic religious group, groups played in, in, in Indonesian politics before and after reform? And uh, did religious minorities play a role in, in, in the democratic transformation after uh, the revolution? And uh, the other question is um, I understand that she has said repeatedly that she hasn't made 100% transformation into democracy. But are the people in Indonesia starting to feel more or less that they are reaping the fruits of democracy, or are they feeling that more or less in all those years there hasn't been that much of an improvement or the improvement that has not met expectations? Thank you very much. Uh, all right, I'll keep these and then I'll talk to the right side. Thank you. My name is Mohamed Abdul Tamaloya. Questions from yeah. two gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, as far as I understood, uh, from in both countries there were no revolutions. And in both countries we did not deal with shift to have a new constitution. We had certain amendments, yeah. but no new constitution. My first, first question is would it be necessary for a transitional democracy to have a new constitution? And the other question is to know uh, you have both insisted on the element of time required for, the success, for a successful transition uh, and that we cannot control the results. To a certain extent there is a risk. Uh, my question to both of you, can a transitional democracy afford failures? Can, can a transitional, uh, can we commit mistakes? For uh, the last question for the first round here. There will be a second round. Please. Uh, my question actually for both speakers. Uh, can you tell us about how, what is the status of trust now in, the, in most countries? Uh, trust between local government and central government, trust between uh, off citizens and work parties, and what is the status of civic engagement? Do young people in Indonesia or Poland uh, engage in political life, engage in civic, uh, civic society organizations? Sorry, thank you. Uh, we listen now to answers. Uh, you know, three minutes. 
social democratic program we tried to advance the democratic negotiations, we went outright in a totally different direction to really the market-oriented liberal economy. But we had soon two extremely important major, I would say, strategic projects. And these were to enter, enter NATO and enter the European Union. And for us, entering NATO was extremely important because Europe was, as you know, divided you know, after the Second World War. Then when communism fell, well, this division became not as clear, but we were in kind of a gray zone, and we were very much afraid that, you know, being in a gray zone is not a healthy situation. We were sort of sandwiched between the European Union and NATO on one side, and very far for Russia on the other side. So we simply saw that it is of utmost importance to have sort of our position absolutely clearly determined. And that's why we wanted to, 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 to join NATO for various reasons. Uh, well, one reason, well, if you give me an allowance of two minutes, I will tell you a joke which really illustrates our way of thinking. And the joke is about, about a, a, a person who was a schizophrenic, and he was, of course, he saw that he's a mouse, he was still a great doctor. The doctor finally concluded that you know, the treatment is treated, so he allowed this patient to go. Uh, he went off, and then he became extremely frightened and agitated. And the doctor asks, well, Why are you so frightened? And then he said, Well, doctor, there's a cat sitting there. So I said, It's a problem. You know that you're not a mouse. I do, but that's she. <laughs> so, so we wanted the cat to know that we are not a mouse, and that's why we wanted to join NATO. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and there was the European Union, uh, which was extremely, we consider European Union membership as a sort of civilizational decision. It was extremely important, uh, and that was again something which varied a lot of political groups, but not all of them, and incidentally, the, 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 the approval and the support of the church was quite important in, in sort of gaining people behind this program and also allowing us to win the referendum. Uh, then, uh, what with, 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 with sort of uh, old, 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 old timers and, and, and um, well, in Poland we had a situation in which practically all in the, all intellectuals and artists abandoned the party under the solidarity. To, to that extent that simply TV programs were absolutely ruined because no one did, nobody wanted to, to participate in these programs. Uh, so the same with radio. It was it was boycott, boycott of, of even of all TV celebrities. And so that was easy. The problem was, however, with with the function. And this was, I can tell you, this was something which was really very, very serious problem to us. Well, the, 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 the chance to form a non communist government sort of materialized. I honestly uh, can tell you that I was against. I thought that that was premature. Because what I was afraid, and many of us were afraid of, was that, you know, with this old timer sitting in all this administration, in all ministries and everywhere, uh, trying to sabotage what we will decide as a government that could bring the country to a halt and we would be compromised. Uh, that was our worry. What we, uh, what fortunately, you know, we decided to bank on uh, was a certain feature which is not very glorious, uh, but sometimes it is useful, and this is unfortunate. <laughs> so that one, once, once all these functionaries would realize that, you know, it is new, power and there is no return to the world system. They will try up to their capabilities but somehow to follow. And this is why we somehow we managed to incorporate uh, you know all, all, all these people and we said from the very beginning that you know we will simply try to, to put